thanks for joining us for this live stream conversation. Um, we're so delighted that you're part of CMRAMA, and uh, we have two great speakers today. Um, Mark Weber, who was a producer of Poverty Inc. and who can talk to us about the or origination and why it was created and how, th how that process came to be. Um, and Ver Veronica Moreno, who works with Thousand Currents, and you're going to hear about why they have removed international development from their name and how it relates to the work of Poverty Inc. So can I just ask each of you to introduce yourselves? I'll just do really briefly. My name is Daniela Poppy Thornton. Um, I've been the deputy director at the School Center for the last few years. Um, I'm just moving on from that role. Uh, and I did some uh, six years of work in Cambodia that relates to international development um, and have had the chance to meet with Mark and be really inspired by, by the work of Poverty Inc. So I'm delighted to be hosting the conversation today. Um, Mark, do you want to introduce yourself and then, and then Veronica? Sure. Thanks, Daniela. Um, uh, as she said, my name is Mark Weber. I'm calling you from the MIT Media Lab today, where I work at the Digital Currency Initiative, which is a research group focused on blockchain technology um, and, and how we can harness peer-to-peer -peer, um, protocols and distributed ledgers for the public good. Specifically, I work on a, a project it's focused on unlocking um, asset registries such as land registries and agricultural commodities and other types of products um, to help small and medium-sized enterprises plug into the financial system. So you saw a chapter in the film called Excluded, which is about how we kind of reframe poverty away from this $2 a day kind of mindset toward more of an understanding of systems and networks and complexity as far as um, people systematically being excluded from networks of productivity and exchange. Um, and as Daniela said, I was a co-producer of Poverty Inc. And, um, and I'm delighted to talk about that in depth today. Fabulous. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Veronica. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Veronica Moreno, and I am currently serving as the Community Engagement Manager at Thousand Currents. Um, I've uh, I've been with Thousand Currents for a couple years. I was a Fulbright in Argentina, um, and I also studied film in, in France. And so this uh, film was particularly uh, interesting to me because it was a convergence of many different things uh, that are near and dear to my heart. So I'm excited to uh, have this conversation today. Fabulous. So, Mark, why don't we start with you? Um, I'm sure... Uh, people would love to know a bit about the impetus for starting the film and what did you hope people would walk away from in when they've seen Poverty Inc? It's interesting, you know, um, I think documentary films are, you know, are very different. There's a whole spectrum of them. I, I, looking back and reflecting on our work, it was interesting to see where we began and where we, end, where we end it, ended up. We went in with each of us, I think, has a different origin story in terms of how, what, what, what motivated us to be involved in, in, in the project. For me, it was, uh, and Daniela, you can relate to this, Daniela and I share an alma mater in Notre Dame. Um, I was on the, when I was in college, I was on the Notre Dame boxing team. And we have um, an over 80 year history of, of supporting um, Catholic missions in Bangladesh. And in 2008, I went over to Bangladesh for the first time, and it was very interesting kind of bridging what had been a cause for us, raising money to support schools and other, and other uh, initiatives in Bangladesh, and then actually meeting people in person. Um, the boxing team to this day actually has a motto called, strong bodies fight, that weak bodies may be nourished. And this is a motto that every single boxer um, is told the first day they walk into the gym and it immediately kind of orients the team toward something bigger than yourself. And, and, and in a way it achieves that, achieves this kind of, there's something bigger than boxing going on here. And yet, uh, I'll never forget the first village school that we visited in Bangladesh. And by the way, this is not just my first trip, this is the first group of students that had ever actually gone over to Bangladesh um, to visit. We've been supporting the missions through the relationship the university had, but this is the first group of students. And I'll never forget that first village school that we visited. These young girls came in and they 
did this beautiful uh, singing and cultural dancing and presented us with flowers and I'm crying. And then we're presented by this Bengali priest uh, to the school and he says, these are the Notre Dame boxers and we owe them a great uh, deal of gratitude for all their support for many years. And they have this beautiful motto, it's strong bodies fight and they are the strong bodies that weak bodies may be nourished and we are the weak bodies. Oh gosh. <laughs> and there was this, and he's a Bengali priest and he's like, as he says it, this awkwardness sets in and the girls looked at us with like confusion and we just kind of sank in our seats and this motto that we had been so proud of and is on all of our posters and our t-shirts and, and, and is like, as I said, is like the, the, the pinnacle of what we do suddenly made us feel ashamed. And that was the first moment I had where I realized how what I, what, I, what I didn't have words for at the time, but now we have words to describe this. We have this tendency to turn the poor into the objects of our charity rather than understanding people properly as the subjects and active protagonists in their own story of development. And there's, right. you know, words like partnership are very buzzwordy, but in a very real way, like transitioning from cause to relationship. That was, for me, the origin story of why I got involved in this. Thanks, Mark. Veronica, mm -hmm. that, that sounds like it relates to some of the shifts that you all are doing right now at Thousand Currents. Can you, can you relate or share, especially in your yeah. role? partnerships I'm sure yeah most definitely um yeah thousand currents is a 30 plus year organization and um you know we've we've learned a lot throughout these 30 years and one of the biggest uh biggest things that we've learned is that we have to be able to shift and adapt and evolve and um really um take in what our partners are saying on the front lines and understand what our role is and so um after 30 years of learning um, we've discovered that uh, how loaded the, the term international development has become and the, the implied dynamic and paradigm that comes with it. And so we needed a name that reflected more of how our model works, how our relationship, relationship building model um, really, uh, we wanted something that embodied that. And so um, the naming, the, the rebranding process itself was, uh, was kind of a collective effort of our, our major stakeholders. So our and you partners, gave out you gave away international development. You removed that. Why? We yes. removed it. A few sentences. Yes. Yeah. We yeah we removed we removed international development. Um, it's it's uh, it's a term that's that's been co opted. It's a term that is no longer resonates with us in the work that we do anymore. Um, like I said, we needed something something that reflected what our actual model was and who we are, um, and not only ourselves as a own organization, but something that reflects our partners and their work as well, right. Um, right. because that is the mandate that we have is to kind of reflect right. and amplify their voices, um, particularly in the global north. Um, okay. So both of you touched on, on this, and I, I mean, thank you for using the term global north. I never know which term we should all be using, but let's stick with that one for, for this conversation. So it seems like in the global north, a lot of people regard people in the global south as as needing aid, we, d we discuss our interactions with them as aid, as development, mm -hmm. and yet it seems like across the global north right now, there's a lot of conversations going on around, you know, poverty issues locally that are about, like, how do we reduce dependence? You know, it seems like there's this dichotomy of how people think about poor people in their backyard and in their own community versus poor people, quote unquote, living abroad. So where do you think that disconnect comes from and, and you know, what's going on there? Well, I, I want to commend um, commend you guys on the international development term. I think, I think it's very interesting. You know, it's it's easy to kind of dismiss these discussions over what is the right wording as semantics or as political correctness, and some sometimes it is. But I also think that words have a lot of meaning, and and, and as you say, the 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 term international development, be like it it by definition is outside in. You know, it's by definition top down. And so it does frame th your thinking by using that words, by having international development majors in college, like the, 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 from the, from the 
from the jump, from the base assumptions, there is a certain kind of colonialist remnant mentality that, that I think ultimately affects what you do and okay. how you do it, and also how you're received by the communities that you're trying to serve. Um, the, you know, I never know, I, know, I never know what the right word is as far as global north or, or, you know, or right. but, but on, I think what you touch upon as far as the dichotomy between local and far away, you know, we have this very strong um, tendency to kind of romanticize these far away places and in doing so, you know, they're much more exotic, they're, 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 they're they're, they're very exotic and interesting and adventure. We kind of use service sometimes to justify our desire to go explore faraway places. And in doing so, sometimes we look right over the head of people that are in our own community who really need us. And I think when you shift to more of a relational model of service um, in, in the broadest sense of that word and charity in the, in the broadest sense of that word, yeah, you know, I think part of that reframing is shifting away. Okay, service is not this one week a year I go on a mission trip. It's how I live my everyday life. And in my everyday life, there are people in my community who I can have an ongoing relationship with. And maybe that relationship is just being somebody to talk to. Maybe it's being a mentor. Maybe it's being somebody who affirms the dignity of somebody who feels down and out every single day. And I think that I think encouraging a culture of relationship service, relationship based service, I think it it will bring us back to how we interact in our everyday life in our own communities. And then for some people who do have the d desire to go uh, farther away, the first you know the the first um, uh, step should be learning, not necessarily service. It should be okay. Go go to go to Mexico or Guatemala or, or India, but have a learning mindset before you have a service mindset because you have to understand people first in order to understand where there are opportunities to serve people. You're singing my music, Mark, you know that. So I, in my introduction, I didn't mention that we um, I worked with some people to start something called learning service, which is exactly that. And the motto that we use, mm -hmm. uh, it's the framing of the book that we are working on on this is, action without learning is ignorance learning without action is selfishness right so if we get on the plane and we just hi i'm here to help you people i don't know language i don't know place i don't know history i don't know issues i don't know well that's ignorance right but if and and learning without action that's selfishness right so there's this constant balance so um that was a good transition veronica what do you what do you say when you know, Mark just touched on, on, on kind of advice that he would give people. What advice would you give someone? They say, well, I want to I wanna help. I want to serve, right? So what, where do you tell them to start thinking about this? How, how can people help? Yeah, I think in this particular moment, too, a lot of people are asking that question. Um, and yeah. and it's, a, it's a good question. And the answer isn't linear and it isn't simple and it isn't as sexy as people had wished it would be. Um, it really is about informing yourself and um, really learning who's uh, really learning who is at the front lines and what the front lines are saying about what help is actually useful and impactful. Um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of what we strive to do is keep our, our ear to the ground to a lot of the movements that are happening. A lot of the folks that um, we partner with um, are are in communication with the people that that li that lives are most impacted by issues of climate change of economic injustice um of people that are fighting for food sovereignty it's it's important that we listen first and then build trusting relationships i think that that is my advice i think uh folks are very eager to help and want to come in and suggest ideas um but without the trust building um, and without the relationship building, that's very difficult. That that's asking a lot of the person that may what you would think would need help. Um, I think you have to understand that they have a they are both trying to navigate their everyday reality with also trying to address the the issues that their communities are facing, and so it's not fair to assume that just because you have resources and everything that they're going to just openly walk into that relationship. So um, 
building trust, uh, learning, like you said, and listening first, and then uh, taking a step forward. Um, that's what I would suggest to folks. And it's, it's, right. a, it's work. <laughs> Right. We just did um, a series with Stanford Social Innovation Review, SSR, on uh, social impact education, and there was an article by Baljeet Sandhu, and I know she's doing a report on this as well, about the value of the lived experience, and you just touched on that, that actually oftentimes people, you know, in, in volunteer travel, we often use conversation around the volunteer and the beneficiary, rather than which puts the beneficiary as just kind of a recipient, rather mm -hmm. than the expert, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the expert on the issue, on the health issue, the water issue, the poverty issue, whatever that is. And and you as the foreigner who haven't lived that issue, you're, you're there to learn from that. So I do think that um, there's a lot of opportunity for reframing, as you said, Mark, around vocabulary. So, um, you know, part of the movie touched on this movement and conversation that's happening across universities where a lot of people used to, to maybe study development, and now you have a lot of interest among young people in social entrepreneurship and this idea of business as a tool for, for, for change. So what's, what's going on with that? And what are your, I mean, can, can the pendulum swing too far in that direction? Is there, what are the negative implications of the enterprise approach to um, development? So I think that, um, you know, in framing any conversation about human flourishing and, and the word, you know, we're not really trying to start a new word, but the word that we, that our group of, of people who made the film most identify with in terms of like what is the goal is really human flourishing. And the reason that that word for me just captures it is because it's so much more than material wealth. It's cultural it's, it's cultural, it's spiritual, it's, it's human, you know? Like being human is just so much more than how many dollars a day you earn and, and, and you know, it, 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 and, and what roads you drive on. And so that's kind of the word that we gravitate okay. to. And part of that is an appreciation of complexity. And so there, the first one of the first principles is that there is no silver bullet, right? And that goes for business and enterprise and entrepreneurship things in our society that play different roles. Um, and, you know, institutions of justice are fundamental. Property rights, gov good governance, uh, rule of law, um, and then our civic institutions, you know, what role do they play? What is the role of culture? And I think that when, when you want to dive into, to, if you're a young person or any person who wants to change the world, um, I think there's a quote from Aristotle that's really valuable. Uh, my mother gave it to me when I graduated high school. The quote is, where your talents and the needs of the world cross, there lies your vocation. And it doesn't say, like, if you want to make an impact, go into this field or go into that field. It says where your unique talents and the needs of the world cross. And I think that's really important as a starting point. When we think about business and entrepreneurship as one of those places where people apply their talents, um, first of all, it's a very broad uh, space. It's it's the broadest space, if you will. There are pe businesses focusing on healthcare. There are businesses focusing on on commodities. There are biz businesses. You know, every every farm is, is is its own little business. So it's not like big corporations and and public stock exchanges. That's not what we mean when we talk about enterprise, for instance. Um, if you understand business properly in that broad sense, there's, there's an empirical fact is that business is the normative way in which people all over the world have risen out of poverty. Meaning just everyday small business, big business, medium business, it's the normative way in which people make an income. The people, if you compare that to the number of people who are employed by other means. And no, so, but you could also, yeah, I see what you're saying as the final normative way, but there could have been support along the way to get, that could have been. Yeah, it doesn't mean that there, yeah. oh, of course. The final yeah. step. It's the final step. <laughs> yeah, it's the normative yeah. way in which people make an income. That yeah, said, yeah. what has allowed people to grow in that and businesses to flourish are these key institutions of justice and good governance and that create an yeah. ecosystem in which people can apply their talents, right? And so it's, in, it's very complex. And that's why I say there's no one space that is more important than all the others. And I think that's one of the dangers with some people who 
who see the value in business and don't want it to be demonized. But th there is also this human tendency to be for that to become a silver bullet syndrome, right? And we saw that with microfinance, for instance, where microfinance for a while was like this new silver bullet that was going to end all poverty. And it isn't because there are so many other things that, that matter as well. Yep. I, but I, the last thing, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this sure. conversation re reminds me of, um, so in Chiapas, Mexico, the, the Zapatistas, they, they opened up their society to the escuelitas and invited folks and they ended the time with their visitors, um, which traditionally they don't have uh, visitors in their communities. And they ended their time with their visitors saying that we didn't bring you here to replicate our model. We didn't bring you here to deprogram you or to train you. Um, we came here and we invited you. And what's next is up to you. Um, what works in our community doesn't necessarily work in this community. And so I... I think in a Western framework, we often think that there's one, there's an issue and there's one solution, whereas uh, an entrepreneurial uh, approach may be suitable for one community, whereas a solidarity economy will, may be suitable for another community. And I think that's um, one of the major, one of the major things that we want to communicate to a, a do-gooder audience to understand that there, it, it is complex and it depends on the factors and the different moving mechanisms within a community that one has to understand and that sometimes we're not the, well, the most well positioned to uh, to come in and and f seek solutions for. Great. And I think uh, I just wrote a report last year called Tackling Heropreneurship. And in the report, I designed something called the Impact Gaps Canvas. And we use that at Oxford, but we've used it. At, uh, it's used at schools around the world. But the, the idea is to help budding change makers or active, you know, social change makers to kind of look at a system that they that they work in, within, right? Because a lot of what you're saying is that a lot of these problems also there's cultural components, but there's also systems that that can't ever be solved by one initiative, like Mark said, microfinance, one action, one organization get scaling to the size of the problem. It's impossible with a really complex issue right so um mark i love that quote um i love the quote that says don't ask what the world needs ask what makes you come alive and go out and do that but i think your your aristotle quote it, it fits that even better so i know that a lot of young people say well i what is my passion what is my thing how do i find that how do i find my foot in the door how do i find where my where what the world needs collides with 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 uh you know my, my skills and passions like what what is your advice for, for a young person who is maybe just graduating from grad school, from undergrad, um, what's that first step towards like a high impact career? Yeah, you know, I don't think any anybody can answer that for you, but I do think that there are principles that you can follow to to learn, right? So I think that I think it's very important to to read a lot, to read history, to read the classics, to read philosophy to understand because because I think those those skills for me in my own in my own journey have been fundamental in my ability to question fundamental assumptions and and to think critically about the world around me. Um, one of my mentors who I respect a lot has he's actually in the film, Michael Fairbanks, he said um, read books, not articles. You know, you can get so caught up in the current event landscape and feel like you have to be on top of everything all the time that there's sometimes we can get caught in this like surface thinking type type um, type flow and so I think as a, as a general principle reading a lot um, thinking critically um, diving into new experiences and new contexts like constantly even in your own communities try to try to put yourself into positions where you can be a minority. Like it, in college, one of the best things I did was I joined the <laughs> the all African American male club on campus, Wabruda, and I was the only white guy. And for me, it was such a formative experience to be like, like one day a week, I was in an environment where I was a minority, and I learned from that, and I and I and I grew from that. And I think that doing that intellectually, doing that culturally, doing it geographically is one of those ways where you can learn more about the world around you. And I think then the, the, that, 
that introspective process of what am I good at and what are my talents and what are my passions will grow organically as you push yourself out of your comfort zone, finding out what you're good at, and then learning enough about the world around you that you find that intersection that you want to operate in. And I love what Veronica said about, I, th I think the word nonlinear is so important. You know, it's like your career path to making the world a better place should, should not be linear. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say should not. For some people, that might be very linear. You know, I have some friends who knew they wanted to become doctors and they took that path and now they're making a huge impact on the world by being doctors and that's great. But it's not linear for all of us. Yeah, and I think great. that, yeah, I'm reminded of, just sorry to make this a little long, but I'm reminded of a quote from Michael Pollan, his book, um, The... Uh, in defense of food is like a critique of the modern industrial agricultural complex and the reductionist mindset that goes into our current agricultural system. And in challenging that, he says something very profound and near the end of his book. He says, I'm not trying to give you a menu of foods that you should and shouldn't eat. I'm trying to give you new eating algorithms or ways of thinking. And when you apply these algorithms, when you're walking through the grocery store, They'll produce an infinite variety of dishes that are healthy for you in the fullest sense of that word. And that's what Poverty Inc. is trying to do with charity. It's like it's not trying to give you a menu of things you should do or do, shouldn't do or organizations you should or shouldn't donate to. It's trying to give you new algorithms for exercising that charitable ethos that you feel and applying yourself to the service of others. And I'd, I'd just like to add to that question, what, what, if I were, uh, what would I say to young people? And I think... I think it's very important to first, before you look outward and, and research and learn, is question, why are you doing this? And if what you want to do, can this be done by somebody in that community? And those type of questions are what's going to help you identify if, you're, if your actions are actually going to be impactful. Uh, one of my greatest mentors, um, Sharon Bridgeworth, who is an amazing uh, artist and playwright, has three guiding questions that we actually use while we do our work at Thousand Currents is, what am I feeling? What is this feeling about? And how does this feeling impact my work? Um, so really taking, uh, really placing ourselves within the landscape of where we're trying to impact and, and making sure that um, we're, do we're not, we're, we're reducing the harm, we're reducing the harm um, and not adding to it. So that's what I would say to a young person. Amazing. Um, I think we're about one minute away from close. So if anyone has, Mark, Veronica, I know you're both doing really important work. Mark, thanks for you know making this film available to all of us. Uh, I'm sure everyone who watched it via Cimarama and beyond uh, have had exactly the experience that you said, which is to have a new set of questions, a new set of frameworks. And Veronica, I know you you all are rethinking philanthropy and rethinking like you know just trying to help us all rethink the questions that we need to be asked uh, in terms of um, uh, the, the foundation and philanthropy side of work. So if you have any final words you want to leave anyone with, we can, we can uh, wrap with final words of advice or thoughts. Sure. So I would just uh, encourage everybody to, to continue uh, watching documentaries and talking about them and sharing them. Um, I, I've seen so many impactful documentaries that have changed the way I eat, changed the way I use plastic, changed the way I... <laughs> go about my work and um, it really, really makes a big difference when you share uh, Poverty Inc. and other documentaries on Facebook and Twi and whatever your social media platforms are. Like I can't tell you how many screenings have come out of somebody just sharing it on Facebook and then how many students or people come to us and say, I changed my major or I changed my career or I changed my life because I saw that film, you know. It, it, films have this powerful impact on us because they allow us to meet other people from around the world who we wouldn't have gotten to meet otherwise. And okay. so I just want to encourage everybody, think deeply, share what you're learning with other people, and just keep watching up more and more documentaries because they're well, really good powerful. Thing. If they're part of Seamarama, they get to do that each month. So it's yeah. fabulous. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Uh, Veronica, any final Final yeah, I would say uh, start with your own community. Get connected to those that are, are helping that community. And um, you'll be surprised what talents and skills you can lend and offer and change and shift 
your own backyard. So start there. Um, and if you're looking for models and inspiration, visit Thousand Currents uh, and learn about the different models and indigenous practices that folks are using to address things like climate change, food sovereignty, um, and economic justice. So. Fabulous. You thank you both for the work that you do. And thank you, Seema Rama team, for making these films available to people around the world. And thanks for watching. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.